Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Turning Point UK Live. Um, today, we're going to be a bit more interactive than normal. So if everyone can let us know where you're tuning in from or if you want us to discuss any questions, if you drop them in the comment thread, we can see all the comments and we can actually bring them on the screen. Uh, so let us know where you're tuning in from. It's great to have a great audience here today, and we've got very exciting guests coming up. Oscar, would you like to introduce our great guest this evening? Um, our guest is someone who I've, um, I've been following for a number of years, and he won't know it, but uh, last year at the, there was a Labour Fringe event, a Labour Leave um, event in Brighton, because I, I go to uh, University of Brighton and I actually attended it, um, sort of undercover. But no, it was, um, it was a fantastic event, and um, he's, a, he's a very interesting character. He's uh, from the Labour Party, he's a trade unionist, uh, he's a firefighter as well, um, and he's re recently uh, written a book and published it called uh, Despised Wide Modern Left Loathe Working Class. So it'll be a really interesting conversation with um, Mr. Paul Embry. Hi, Paul. Thank you Hi. for joining us today. Good to be with you. Thank you. I think so, how are you doing today? I'm um, very well, thank you. Yeah. Um, struggling on, going a bit stir crazy like a lot of people, I guess. But uh, yeah, I've been worse. I think okay. the uh, first thing to say uh, to Paul is obviously to um, thank him for coming on and we obviously have very different politics but um you know these conversations as, as i think and, and jack thinks i think paul i think himself they need to be um happening more often between sort of the left and the right and sort of coming to some sort of disagreements agreements and whatever so let's start with um your book and let's start with obviously the book is about how um sort of labor has um sort of, as you put it quite strongly despise and loathe the working class what I want to know really is sort of when did that start and why sort of did it start? Well, I think it began to happen around about the late 1980s when Labour decided for all sorts of reasons to, to drink what I call a poisonous brew of social and economic liberalism. Um, and then I think after Tony Blair took over in 1994, um, and I think that process then began to, to intensify the rift, if you like, between the traditional working class in this country uh, and the, the Labour Party, which many are tr uh, traditionally seen as their own party. But I think particularly it began to intensify in the first decade of this century. Um, I think that was the period that we began to see in many working class communities the real acute effects of globalization, um, deindustrialization, the impact of a more liberal immigration policy. Um, people in particularly in traditional working class communities in what might be called blue collar communities in labor heartlands uh, began to experience deindustrialization, local industries closing, jobs being shipped abroad. I saw that in my own community where I grew up in Dagenham. Um, with the, the production at the famous Ford plant um, going across to, to Germany. Um, people began to see very rapid um, demographic change in their communities. Um, and they were uncomfortable with this. Many working class people were simply uncomfortable with it, not because they were intolerant or bigoted, um, but simply because their sense of order was, was being violated. And they didn't particularly see uh, many economic benefits from it either. And when they looked at their representatives in the in the Labour movement, Labour Party and the trade unions to stand up for them and to, 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 to address their concerns, um, they really saw a Labour movement that was, was completely behind the changes that were taking place by and large. Um, so I think that's when the, 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 the rot really began to set in, in earnest. Labour began to lose large parts of the working class vote, many of them um, began to abstain or vote for, for UKIP or the BNP. Um, and I think we're at a stage now where that, that process has reached its nadir in terms of the relationship between Labour and the working class. And, and we saw that in, uh, in the election last December. See, from um, sort of my perspective, the way it's from someone on the right, I can see, sort of see the working class, uh, sorry, the, the Labour Party, as I see it sort of in the hands of two quite radical groups. I see sort of um, a sort of neo-Marxist element with um, McDonnell and, and that type of politics. And then I see sort of the globalist um, Blair type of politics, but I don't actually see um, that as sort of yourself as sort of the blue Labour movement. I don't really see 
sort of patriotic, pro-nation, sort of pro-working class policies really being represented um, at all really in the in the Labour Party anymore. I can sort of only see those two strands. Uh, yeah, I think that's broadly accurate. Um, certainly the likes of, of Blue Labour, the group that I'm involved in, um, are a fringe tendency within the within the Labour Party at the moment. And I think the, 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 the dominant groups are those kind of on the one hand, what you know, what they call themselves the, the centrists, the liberal progressive element, the Blairites, um, and on the other hand, the kind of hard left slash, uh, slash far left element. Um, which has kind of coalesced more recently over recent years around Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, it strikes me actually that those two groups probably have more in common than either would like to admit. Um, they're both quite globalist in view. They're both kind of populated by um, middle class people. Um, they're both kind of liberal in their in their general outlook. There are differences, I think, around economic policy and foreign policy. Um, but those two elements, I, I call them a, a fusion between Lenin and Lenin, John Lennon and Vladimir Lenin, um, are pretty kind of dominant in the in the Labour Party today. And I certainly don't argue, and I've never argued, that the Labour Party can rely solely on its old industrial working class vote, um, you know, the blue collar vote to, to storm to victory. I mean, historically, the Labour Party has always been a coalition of its traditional working class and of a layer of like more middle class liberal people who have, who have found the Labour Party and its policies appealing. And I think when it's been most successful, it's managed to hold that coalition together. I call it the Hampstead and Hartlepool coalition. You know, it's mainly Hartlepool, but with a dash of Hampstead. I think the problem is that over recent years, that coalition has become so unbalanced. It's become dominated by Hampstead. Hartlepool has pretty much been elbowed out. Um, and because of that, large elements of, of the working class simply don't vote for the party anymore because it doesn't look or sound like them. And until it can win those people back, the, the Labour Party ain't going to win again. So I guess you mentioned sort of at the start that Labour sort of led in and supported a lot of immigration. Why do you think they are so sort of pushing of an um, of increasing immigration in the UK, despite it directly impacting on sort of their core vote, the working class. Because I think many people inside the Labour Party live very different lives to to people out there in the provinces, people living in post-industrial Britain, particularly post-industrial England, um, small town Britain, coastal Britain, some of our ne neglected um, coastal communities. I think if you look at the the Labour Party, I'm still a member of the Labour Party. I've been a member of the Labour Party for 26 years. But in my time, the, 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 party, the party's own demographic has changed quite radically. It's become much more middle class. I think the, the a recent survey a couple of years ago showed that 77% of Labour Party members fall into what's called the ABC1 category, the occupational middle class. Uh, many of them live in the South. Many of them live in London, very kind of London-centric. Um, and it's become... Sadly, in my view, uh, a party for students, uh, graduates, for, for middle class liberals in the fashionable cities, for social activists. Um, and these people have a very different view of issues like immigration to the view held by traditional working class people. They, are, they have a much more relaxed view about it. Um, because they often themselves come from a more fortunate station in life. They can afford to travel. They can afford to, to work abroad. They might have an au pair. They go down the, the, the high street in their nice city and, you know, they can eat in all sorts of different restaurants. Um, if you live that life, then you can see the benefits of a very relaxed immigration policy. If you're living in uh, a working class heartland, which is deindustrialized and you're fighting for your job, um, and suddenly you, you see um, an influx of, of cheap labour. And I don't mean that in a, in a disparaging way towards the people who come. But nonetheless, if there's, a, if there's pressure on wages, pressure on public services, etc., then you have a very, very different view of immigration and you're more likely to want it to be regulated. I mean, I'm pro-immigration. I've always been pro-immigration. I think it's a good thing. But I think like all good things it needs to be regulated and the fascinating thing for me is once upon a time that was the mainstream view on the left most people on the left understood that you know the, the control of the labor supply was a market dynamic and like like market dynamics it needed relating to, to provide the best outcome for, for workers uh, now that's almost left in the labor party and you say that and you're guided as some sort of nativist or, or bigger and i think that's the as i outlined that's the the reasons for it I think if you I definitely, I think actually, if you, um, 
if you um as you said if you sort of look back and look at sort of the, the sort of the tony ben and the sort of peter shaw things especially um they were sort of they i think these days really that they, they they would be really on the fringes of the labor party they they really wouldn't sort of get especially sort of the peter shaw type they wouldn't really get a look in into and they wouldn't recognize the party um what it is now and really what interests me is is the fact that um even on someone that i would consider myself on the right it is sort of um capture that sort of started or, or at least accelerated sort of um uh, uh, industrialization it's the conservatives that um imposed austerity for good or for bad but imposed austerity which was sort of um say bad for working class people it's conservatives which um put through brexit which you know i think is positive and, and so yourself but still caused a lot of chaos but despite all of this in the 20 um, 19 election, I mean, Bolsover going conservative, Dennis Skinner losing a seat, all of this sort of thing, and and and, um, and myself, I can't see a, a way back for Labour at all um, to sort of get sort of mainstream Labour uh, to, to sort of get hold of the party. I don't know whether you think sort of um, the, the the sort of blue Labour types and, and the traditional Labour can actually get hold of the party again in the future, or whether you need to start a new party. Um, million dollar question. Um, it's certainly a mountain to climb. Uh, yeah, Labour is, is still in the foothills of that and there's, there's certainly no way back to power for Labour that doesn't, that doesn't pass through those so-called red wall seats, the Bolsovers and, and the Blythe Valleys and the Don Valleys and the Wrexhams and the Great Grimsby's, all of these places that have been Labour since time immemorial. Um, but voted Tory for the first time last time, uh, last time out at the, at the general election. Um, I mean, you mentioned the, the you know traditional Labour people like Peter Shaw and Tony Benn. I mean, Peter Shaw, I think, was was a fantastic um, principled politician, very strongly opposed to um, deeper European integration, believed in democracy and self-government. Uh, I mean, you can go onto YouTube now and see a speech that he gave to the Oxford Union back during the 1975 common market referendum, and it, it really does bring up goosebumps. And yeah, Peter Shaw, who was a huge player in the Labour Party in the 70s, um, and, you know, a, a real heavyweight political heavyweight and a great in intellect, he would be seen now, I'm pretty sure, as, as a headbanger in the Labour Party. Um, he would be seen as on the fringes of the Labour Party, like most people who uh, voted Brexit are. Um, and actually, there was always in the Labour Party a very strong Eurosceptic thread. I mean, if you go back to the 1975 common market referendum, a uh, huge number of Labour MPs voted no. A majority of trade unions did no um, because of their belief in democracy and self-government. And many of them um, would have seen the... EU or the common market at the time as a, as a capitalist club. And I think that that, I think that process has intense, you know, over the years. Um, so that is definitely a demonstration of, of how Labour has fundamentally changed over the years. Uh, can it win again? I mean, I terms of building an alternative, for, as you said, I, we are pretty much a two party other than, in, you know, Scotland and uh, perhaps to a lesser degree, Wales. Uh, Britain is pretty much a two-party. England certainly is a two-party, uh, a two-party state. No one, uh, no party that has tried to break through as a third party has had much success over the recent decades. I don't see that happen. Um, the Labour Party, for me, is still the vehicle by ordinary working class people can best advance their their interests. It's historically played that role in alliance with trade unions, etc. But, you know, I, I don't under what there is to be done. The Labour Party is not going to win power again until it really changes itself, until it changes its language, until it changes its priorities, until it gets away from some of the more fringe stroke secondary issues that, that seem to obsess many, many of its foot soldiers and gets back on to, to discussing the things that matter to ordinary working class people. So I guess um, the next sort of topic we'll ask you about is how do you think Labour can address sort of the extremism in the Labour Party, polit uh, particularly the far left sort of rise in communism at the moment? So you've got people like Ash Sarkar in the Labour Party pushing for luxury communism. Obviously, you had Diane Abbott saying Mao did more harm, uh, good than harm. Um, you had McDonnell posing with um, sort of communist banners behind him, uh, quoting from Mao in the House of Commons, obviously similar with Corbyn giving speeches at rallies with communist flags. How can you sort of remove communism from the Labour Party or, delete, uh, or decrease its influence? Well, 
I mean, interestingly, the, historically, the, the Labour movement and the Labour Party itself has always had um, a you know, tradition of, if you like, communism and Trotskyists in it and Marxists in it, probably uh, you know, fewer in number perhaps than, than now. But, but they, you know, there have always been these people in and around the, the, uh, the Labour Party. Um, I mean, I'm not in favour of political purges. I don't like political purges. Uh, I don't think they tend to work, actually. I think that you're much better off debating people and trying to, to win the battle of ideas. Um, so I'm not in favour of, of saying that anybody who doesn't agree with me in the Labour Party, you know, should be should be kicked out. I do think there's a question over, you know, the Labour Party has always believed in constitutional politics, has always believed in parliamentary democracy. I do think there's a question over whether or not, you know, though some of the people inside it believe in that. Uh, and I've absolutely no doubt that there are people who have in recent years jumped into the Labour Party because they would never win an election if they were to, to stand under their own banner. Previously, there'd been, you know, members of, of far left political who always pick up a very tiny number of votes at election time. So, so I don't like to see, you know, some of the entry and that, that goes on. Um, but I don't equally want to, to see a, a civil war. I just think you have a debate with these people about why some of their ideas are wrong. Um, and I think, you know, you need to point out to them the, the proof that, that their ideas do not go down well with the electorate, because look what happened in 2019. These people were pretty much in charge of the Labour Party in terms of its policy, in terms of its strategy. Um, and it was the Labour Party's worst result since 1935. And I know a lot of them have actually left, actually. If you look at the figures since Keir Starmer took over, I think thousands of these people who joined the party in 2015 when Corbyn took over as leader have, have since left. And, you know, I, I'm not going to shed any tears that, that they've gone. But fundamentally, I want to win the battle of ideas in the Labour Party. That's what you need to try to do. Is that, um, do you think that's um, moving sort of half, half onto the topic of, of China, um, is there sort of a uh, sort of sympathy, maybe that's sort of a strong word, but is that why um, sort of the, the, a lot of people in the sort of um, fringes of the Labour Party, sort of the far left, are overlooking this, um, the, the Uyghur Muslims that are, that are sort of being um, killed and sort of put into camps in China? I mean, that also happens on the right. I think there's a lot of money influence um, that can come from China that means sort of people on the right don't actually call it out, but is that why there's a lot of people on, on the left, or some people on the left, that, that actually don't, I don't call out China as, as they should? That is certainly the reason why some of them don't do it, and more than that, um, some of them actually applaud it and, and celebrate um, the Chinese regime, and they present it as some wonderful beacon of socialism which for me, it really isn't. Um, I mean, the, I, I call myself a democratic socialist. Um, democracy and socialism, in my view, um, go hand in hand. And if you, if you have to force your regime on people, and it strikes me that you probably haven't won the argument. So I have no sympathy with, with China at all. But there are some people on the left from, you know, traditionally what's been called perhaps the, the Stalinist left, the more authoritarian left, the people who once upon a time would have defended the Soviet Union. Um, you know, people on a time would have been members of the British Communist Party, perhaps may now be, may now be inside the Labour Party, um, who, who would defend it. Um, and, you know, I think those people are profoundly wrong. For me, China is the worst of both worlds. It's, it's, it's kind of embraced... Um, the worst strains, uh, in my view, of free market capitalism and neoliberalism at the same time as being completely kind of authoritarian in, in nature. And, you know, you can look at what they're doing, as you said, to the Uyghur Muslims. I look at what they're doing to trade unionists. They turn the army on trade unionists who dare to challenge the race. No um, kind of pluralism or, or free speech inside of, of China. You look at what they've done in, in Tibet. You look at the... the, the kind of wicked birth control policy that they have. Uh, I, I'm staggered that anybody, whatever their politics, could even could even try to defend it. But, but there are people who do, that's true. On the topic of trade unionism, how do you think um, trade unions fit into the sort of modern world? Cause I use examples. So my granddad was a big trade unionist, and actually he was involved uh, as a dockyard worker, and he unfortunately he died of asbestos poisoning when the government knew 
that uh, it was poisonous for people to work with asbestos, but it was cheaper for them to give them a payout at the end of it rather than actually give them protective gear. So I can see sort of an argument for unions in actually um, protecting workers and workers' rights. Doctor, my granddad did die because of people exploiting him essentially. But now where I would argue most workers' rights have largely been achieved, um, where does the place of unions come in? Because you're seeing a big exploitation of union power with things like the underground where people are threatening strikes. I think we had one a few years ago where um, underground drivers were threatening to strike over the fact they didn't have a coffee machine in their office. Um, so as I said, where do, you, where do you see unions fitting into the modern world? Well, I think trade unions are a fundamental part of any free society. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, if you if you believe in the ability of people to be able to challenge uh, a boss who made unfairly and, and as a last resort, withdraw their labour um, in a free society, I think trade unions have their place. It's not all about industrial disputes, of course. You know, trade unions do lots of other things which never make the headlines. I mean, they're involved with something called the Union Learning Fund. Uh, where they help to um, they put on education courses around a whole range of, of themes for, for their members and their members' family and often work in conjunction with employers in doing that. I mean, lots of evidence to say that where trade unions are present in a workplace, wages are better, industrial relations are offered, and lots of employers um, actually like dealing with trade unions um, because they, they know that they're speaking on behalf of the representatives of the, the, the workforce rather than just trying to deal with individuals uh, you know on a on a one to one basis but for me look i i think that the vast majority of advances that have been by ordinary workers in their workplace have come out through the efforts of trade unions you know it's very rare for an employer um to, to hand workers anything on a plate without workers having to, to for it. I mean, you mentioned, you know, uh, the industrial injuries that workers have, have often suffered in the past, and it's because of campaigning for better health and safety laws that, that you know, the number of industrial injuries has, has reduced dramatically over the last century. Um, you know, things like the national minimum wage, you know, previously, before that, we would have working on a, on a pittance. Um, I think it's a fundamental part of a civilised society that you say, actually, you know, all employers should be required to pay at, the, at least this minimum wage. Um, campaigning for things like better pensions in the, in the workplace, shorter working hours. Once upon a time, you know, people in this country would work excessive hours to the degree where it really impacted on, and still does to a certain degree, impacted on their um, their home life and their their well being, etc. So, so look, I I'm not going to suggest that I would support every decision or every dispute that, that every trade union has, has ever launched uh, or made. Um, but by and large, I think they are a, a, a key part of a, of a properly functioning economy and of a civilized and democratic society. And on balance, I think they've done much much more good than harm over the years. Fair enough. I guess the sort of follow-up question I'd ask is, so something which is thrown at trade unions a lot um, as a criticism is a lot of trade union bosses are paid six-figure salaries. So uh, some of them, they run on the narrative, they sort of embrace sort of hard left policy saying, look at these bosses are being paid a lot of money and they're exploiting your labour. Yeah, I think it's the 12 union bosses that are on six-figure salaries themselves. It's like, how would you sort of respond to that or how could you justify that sort of when they're meant to be working for workers' rights, but they're using their money to sort of line their pockets? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I mean, I, I don't defend uh, the concept of trade union bosses being on pay levels that most of their members can only dream of. I think that if you purport to be a voice of the workforce, then your conditions and your pay uh, and your lifestyle actually shouldn't be that far removed from the people that you're, you're speaking to. What I would say, however, um, respectfully, is I don't think that people on the right necessarily are in a position to, to lecture on that because I often hear, you know, when, when for example, people on the left, people like myself, and people in trade unions uh, challenge um, fat cats pay or, you know, bonuses paid to, to be in the city, boardroom excesses. Uh, we're often told to wind our necks in because, you know, we're, we're espousing the politics of envy. You know, if people want to get on in life and, you know, people want to earn money, we should, in, we should encourage that. It seems to me that some people on the right, when trade union 
officials do that all of a sudden. So, but that that isn't acceptable. So, so I think there's a certain amount of double standards there. But but I certainly agree with the point, as I said, that uh, that trade union officials should not be on pay, which is in a different stratosphere to to the average member. I think there's a real danger when that does happen. Uh, that they become out of touch, um, that they that they are not subject to the same daily pressures in terms of their own personal finances and conditions of service that their members are, uh, and therefore end up being not best placed to, to represent them. But what I would say also, however, is there's a huge number of union reps who are not on that sort of pay, uh, often not on any pay at all, just volunteers, but nonetheless go out and, and do what they do because they want to protect people in the in the workplace, and we shouldn't forget that either. Yeah, um, I uh, sort of in response to that, I say I think there there is a difference between being a um, a trade union representative and trying to um, yeah and, and basically you're you're, you're 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 putting sort of your moral compass up there in terms of your workers to earn more money, um, but actually yourself is earning a hell of a lot more than the, than the people that you're representing, and actually sort of being a big time boss where you're employing a hell of a lot of people. I think there's actually a, a difference in, in sort of morality there. Um, Quick one to touch though, um, so I know we don't have a lot of time left. On uh, there's a couple of people asking on sort of the Black Lives Matter movement and how um, that's um, sort of impacted both the left and the right, um, and how that is effectively it's a, it's a neo Marxist or not or Marxist organization, but because of sort of the, I think the branding of it because it's Black Lives Matter, it's sort of being adopted by um, not just sort of the Labour Party but also uh, big corporations and big business being uh, adopted by that and a few sort of you know, criticisms of it you're almost seen as a bigot racist and, and, and sort of anti-black yeah i think i think the whole thing has been divisive actually um i think there was a, there was a report in the guardian a couple of days ago which i think said that that two-thirds of people i think had, had believed that that race relations had been set back um as a result of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And in fact, interestingly, 44% um, of, of, of black and minority people themselves um, actually believed that to be the case. Um, I mean, there are, I, I, I say, look, I don't support Black Lives Matter, capital BLM trademark, but, but I do obviously support the idea, locates that Black Lives Matter. Um, I'll have no truck with anybody who, who, who says that black lives don't matter. I think, um, you know, where the, the idea that people should suffer prejudice simply because of the colour of their skin, I think the vast majority of, of people now understand that that's completely wrong. And where there, where there is racism and prejudice, and, you know, it still exists, I think we have to accept that, it, it should be challenged. But I believe equally you have to take people with you. Um, you know, you need to build the, the, the maximum unity if you're going to challenge racism and prejudice. And you don't do that by tearing statues down and violate people's sense of history. If a statue, if people think a statue should come down, they should have a proper democratic debate about that and involve the local community. I don't think you just, you just, you know, do it through vandalism. Um, and I don't think you do it through coming up with concepts like white privilege and, and almost casting you know, people with white skin as if they're guilty of some kind of original sin and, and have to absolve themselves of it. Again, I think that's completely divisive. And then when you get into the nitty gritty of Black Lives Matter, you look at defunding the police, abolishing the nuclear family and stuff like that. That's not something that I would, I would have sympathy with. Um, so, so, yeah, I understand people who say it's been divisive. I'm in, I'm in favour of unity between black people and white people but I don't think they've done much to bring that about. As, as you touched on very quickly, I, th I think that you um, you were talking to about the nuclear family, something that um, yourself but, and especially uh, the Blue Labour movement with um, Glassman uh, sort of talk about a lot and actually it's almost something that I feel people aren't, A, talk about enough for various reasons, I don't know whether it's that people, it's, it's just not, um, it's not engaging enough or whether people are scared to talk about it but one big problem is sort of fatherless families and sort of broken up families. And actually, I, I, in my opinion, I think one of the best ways to deal with um, sort of crime in general, I mean, crime that you see in, in London, except for knife crime and that sort of thing, is through families. But I'm not seeing the politics, both in Labour or the Tories, um, either one, they're almost too scared to actually go to the root of the problem and they're much more happy to sort of spell. Um, uh, slogans like Black Lives Matter and, and Take a Knee and that type of thing rather than go to the root of the problem. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I think the undermining of the, of, of the family um, has, has created huge problems in society. And it's something that, that politicians are, are petrified of ever talking about. And so far as, especially on the left, I see all the time, you know, you raise the idea that the simple idea that children um, are, are better off generally if they're brought up by both parents rather than one parent. Now, every study that's been carried out shows that to be the case, shows that where kids are brought up in a stable family home with both parents, they're more likely to, to, to have better outcomes in terms of their future job prospects, in terms of their um, well-being, etc., cetera, and, and opportunities in life than, than kids who are brought up with one parent. Now, that is not for a moment to suggest that you know, one parent families, the parent isn't doing a good job. There are, there are one parent families where the parent is doing a, 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 you know, a fantastic job. And I believe we should, we should give them all reasonable support in that. And of course, let's not forget the, the, the one parent families, the, 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 the parent who's in it is the parent who stayed. Um, so, so they, you know, they deserved our, our respect, I think. But it's, I mean, for me, and I make this argument in, in the book, for me, the family is almost a kind of socialism in action. Socialism for me is about working together uh, collectively, about, you know, honouring your commitments to each other, obligation to other people, you're the very opposite of individualism, um, loyalty towards others, um, work common good. Um, for me, is, is family is a microcosm of that, and it's where we, it's the unit in which we first first learn rules and we first learn about love and obligation and, and, uh, and respect um, and I just you know it really angers me when when you try to have a debate about why it's important that we should encourage the, the nuclear family people uh, on the right and left come back with well you can't do that because you end up stigmatizing single parents and stigmatizing kids who haven't got two parents uh, well if, if you took that approach then you would never put in a particular point of view because some people who didn't fit into that might be offended then you'd never argue for, for anything and I try to say to people on the left look our, our what we're about is is trying to improve the lives of ordinary people and if part of doing that is by doing what we can as a society as a culture in terms of, of you know our, our legislation our tax rules and everything else to encourage parents to stay together. I, mean, I don't believe in forcing people to stay together, of course, but doing what you can to encourage it and encourage that outcome for the maximum number of children. Um, why would we not want to do that? I find it, I find it bizarre. Um, there are people on the left, like Blue Labour, who do put family front and centre and understand the importance of it, but they're, they're a minority, I'm afraid to say. I guess what I'd ask you as well is sort of touching on, um, I guess, sort of pseudoscience we're seeing now in the modern Labour Party, we're seeing sort of pushing for the adopter of, adoption of all these sort of 36 genders um, or the sort of promotion of that. We're seeing them back sort of not so much trans rights, I think everyone agrees with trans rights to an extent, but backing sort of ridiculous trans rights, like demanding sort of um, men who transition to women to be able to compete in female sports, stuff like that, where again, there's a vast sort of biological difference. Why do you think, again, Labour are backing these sort of modern liberal policies which in theory sort of go against that sort of traditionalist labor labor protection sort of culture um stand, and standards and values um because i think as i touched on out on the out at the outset um the, the party is a fundamentally different party to to what it used to be it's now populated largely by um middle class students and social activists for whom these sorts of issues uh, are um, priorities uh, and you know frankly because in some cases they from that more fortunate station in life where they don't necessarily to obsess about things like jobs uh, and wages and housing and all of the other law and order and all of the other things that actually stress ordinary working class people in their everyday lives sometimes these people are not uh, subject to those sorts of pressures and, and they become these things which for most people are, are, are secondary issues and actually, on the one that you mentioned around gender self-identification, actually affects a tiny, tiny number of the, the, the population. Um, people on the left 
give uh, give give priority to to these issues in a way that that is entirely disproportionate. In fact, the interest they have in it is in inverse proportion to the interest that most ordinary working class people have in in these kinds of issues. And I think the problem for the Labour Party is is as it has gone through that transformation itself and has become much more middle class, much more rooted in in the in the cities with a lot. London-centric, very sort of cosmic and liberal view of the world. So at the same time, the, 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 its priorities have, have changed and they've gone from the ordinary bread and butter thing, jobs and housing and, and, and you know, law and order, to things like these fringe causes. And until Labour can get back onto the, onto the territory of the, the issues that, that matter to people in their everyday lives, and it's got no chance of winning power again. Oh, certainly, I, I think I agree with you there. Um, again, another thing that I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, but the BLM activist who climbed up on the cenotaph, the courts have decided not to charge him and have released him on unconditional discharge. Again, do you think this is sort of justice as such, or what would be your take on that situation? Um, I mean, I, 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 I am aware of the case, although I don't, um, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I probably know that people know that, that I jumped up on the cenotaph and, and I think tried to tried to set light to the Union Jack or something like that, I seem to, to recall. And I did read I did read the story about the, the young discharge. Um I, I I try not to to focus on individual cases particularly. Um and you know I'm not I'm not a hang and flog and type of person, you know. I, I think that when you are young, you sometimes can be a bit hot-headed, a bit too passionate, and sometimes leads you into doing things that you shouldn't do. Um, I believe that unless you've done something, you know, pretty wicked, um, I think most people should be given a second chance in life. Uh, if, if they're young, I don't want to write people off forever. Um, but I do think equally there is a there is a real problem with. You know, as I say, as much as I'm not a hang and flogging type of person, equally, I don't believe that we should be unduly lenient to people. I think we need to give clear messages that there are rules and there are abilities and that actually punishment isn't a dirty word. I know it's kind of people seem to think nowadays that it, that it is. But if you if you do wrong, um, you should suffer, suffer punishment. And, you know, it goes beyond that particular case about the about the cenotaph. It's about setting down clear rules for wider society. And it's the, the, what I find actually is away from these more notable cases. It's the day to day stuff that angers people. It's the day to day lawlessness on their housing estate with people dabbling in drugs and you know, burglaries and the police not coming near nor by, the police have pretty much withdrawn from the streets. That's the thing I think that, that angers that angers people really every day. So I think I think I think you're right. I think with the um especially with the policing, I think there's been uh, even since patch, I think that um actually policing has been to uh, react to crime instead of to prevent it. So you actually see police um the the, the police was set up really by Robert Peel and it was, it was just to was, um, the success of the police was measured by not how many people they catch, but how many uh, how crime goes down. So that was the job of the police. But I think um, one thing that I think, um, my opinion, I think the Tories got wrong was cutting the police so much. Especially, I think that's absolutely devastated a lot of communities, especially in London, the night crime and the rest of it. But I think actually, you see, um, crime has has hugely increased. Um, I'm going to ask you. Um, one more thing before I know you've got to go. Um, uh, yeah, I know you've got to go in five minutes or something. But yeah, yeah, I've got. To, let's let's say let's say I've got ten minutes, guys. If you wanted to do another ten, perfect, minutes, that's okay. perfect. Just like, just on the topic on the topic of um, on Europe um, and the EU. I know that's gone the rest of it, but what's really interested me actually because I saw someone talk about how the left has changed from um, being sort of anti-Europe. I think we touched it earlier too. Europe. And I was listening to this argument by this bloke, I wish I could remember his name, and he's talking about how, as you said, it sort of started in the 80s. And it started really when um, Thatcher came into power and um, the left didn't think that they could get through all of their measures through Parliament and the rest of it. And then the EU came and they sort of uh, believed that with the EU, uh, they could get all these uh, sort of measures through the back door, even though sort of they have Thatcher in power, they kept the, these measures through the back door um, and all, okay, they didn't like sort of the means by it, but the ends was okay because they got through those sort of rights to the rest of it. And I heard that that's sort of the reason why, or one of the reasons why they've changed 
to become the sort of pro-European party. I'd love to sort of know your attitude. Why? What was that change? Because the, the old league used to be very, very anti-Europe. Yeah, well, what, what happened in a nutshell is towards the end of the 1980s, after the trade unions and the Labour Party had been battered by Margaret Thatcher, um, I mean, they'd lost the elections in 79, 83 and 87. Um, and up until then, as I said earlier, there'd always been a very rich tradition of Euroscepticism and movement. Um, but the it got to the end of the 80s and, and they'd lost on three occasions to Margaret Thatcher. We had seen trade unions um, decimated. Um, we'd seen the defeat of the miners. Uh, we'd seen very rigid trade union legislation put in place. Uh, we'd seen attacks on workers' rights and so on. Uh, and the Labour movement came together and said, actually, you know, we need to, we need to find something else. And the EU came riding over the hill. Um, and there was a very significant speech that was made by the, I think, the EU Commission president, I think he was at the time, Jacques Delors, who went to the, the TUC, the Trade Union Congress, their annual congress that year in 1988, and effectively uh, made overtures to them and sent them a love letter and said, look, throw your lot with us, you know, we're going to be a social Europe, we're going to be a workers' Europe, all of the things that you are losing under Thatcher, you'll get back if you're part of the European Union. So it was it was a case really for many on the left of any port in a storm. You know, we're, we're in trouble here, let's link up with these guys, they might be able to help us out. And the truth is, actually, so, so it was kind of born from desperation at, at first, but it's kind of gone from being, on the left, gone from being a, a position of EU scepticism to the position of EU fanaticism throughout the movement. And the, the bizarre thing is actually since the late 1980s, the EU actually, if you're a socialist and a trade unionist like someone like me, the EU has actually gone more and more in the opposite direction to, to you would want it to go. It's become more, neo, more neoliberal. It's become more in favour of privatisation and against public, public ownership. It's become more in favour of austerity. It's very much an explicitly anti-socialist anti institution in many ways. So I kind of think it's one of the talking points of modern politics, the fact that so many of the, uh, will defend death at an institution whose aims and objectives are in many cases completely opposite to what are the traditional aims and, and objectives of the, of the left. And as I say, I, mean, I, I, I often degrees, you know, what the, what the EU, part of the, the Troika, as it was called, the European Central Bank, the IMF and the, the European Union establishment, what they did to Greece, where the people, you know, voted against austerity, um, in, in a national referendum and uh, and the EU said, well, you, you're going to get it anyway, whether you like it or not. Um, and we saw the impact of that increase in terms of the economic distress and the, and the social the social problems that they had. So, so you know, there are a few of us who are still battering away on the left against the EU and um, it will be interesting to see the Labour Party's position if or not we get a deal. I think the worst thing the Labour Party should be doing is calling for any further extensions or, or to rejoin the European Union. There will be people in Labour who will do that, but you know, I, I think that that will go down like a lead balloon in some of those seats that we need to win back. So it's a fascinating debate, it really is. What about your, your um, opinion on um, your current leader, Keir Starmer? Because from a sort of, even from, sort of a, from a neutral perspective, I'm looking at it objectively, I look at his politics, his politics are very much sort of Blairite, it's very, um, Eurocentric, it's globalist, but actually, I, as a neutral perspective, I actually think his rhetoric since becoming leader, I think he's said a lot of the right things. He's been going on about, you know, I love this country, and he said things like, um, uh, well, we want it to be a great country to grow up in, grow old in. His rhetoric has been different to his politics. Now, I'm not sure whether it's which one I can sort of believe. Is it is it his rhetoric? Has he just sort of changed to pick up to get power? And he's going to go back to sort of the Blairism or so that's where I'm thinking. What, what's your opinion of, on sort of the case done? I, I, I tend to very much agree with that assessment, actually. I think he is largely a Blair, right? I mean, he's a, he, like Blair, he was, uh, he was a, a lawyer. Um, like Blair, he kind of lives in North London. Um, he has that very kind of globalist, cosmopolitan, liberal outlook on life. I don't think he instinctively understands people in those red wall unities. I don't think they necessarily 
see him as one of them. And I think, you know, he's very, very pro-EU. He was the architect of the second referendum policy, uh, which you know, helped to destroy Labour at the last election. So I guess I guess I would have said, you know, if you're going to try and recapture those Red Bull seats, you wouldn't start with Keir Starmer. However, that said, I think credit where it's due. Uh, I think he has, as you said, um, done some good things since taking over. I think he's pressed the right buttons in terms of trying to reconnect with some of those those constituencies. He's focused very heavily on the themes of, of family and patriotism and the importance of community, etc. Uh, I think he he has tried to distance himself from from the far left in the party who want to keep him on that obsessive identity politics territory and wokeness and all the other mad things that's done so much damage to the Labour Party. So, you know, I would say so far so good. Um, and I know that he's got some good people around him. I mean, he's got, uh, for example, the director of policy is a woman called Claire Ainsley, who wrote a really good book uh, about the new working class, but has also written some some very stuff on Brexit and it's a family and so on. So I think, you know, people like her are pushing him in the right direction. So I think the problem for Keir Starmer, to be blunt, is is no matter what he says, he, he is going to have to drag a party with him, large parts of which are unwilling to go with him. Uh, I mean, and you saw another mad reaction you know, when he gave his conference speech a couple of months ago, it's that conference speech, it was obviously just a speech to camera because of, of COVID. But when he gave his conference speech a couple of months ago, and he, he focused heavily on those themes of family and patriotism, work, etc., community. And there were people on the left who were attacking him for invoking Vichy France, some people, some people talked about, and, you know, he had a far right, he was flirting with the far right. Um, and this is how far removed from reality some of these people are, you know, the, the fact that you talk about what to most people are ordinary concepts of work and family, community, nation, patriotism, and you're dismissed as being some flag waving fascist. So, so I would say to him, he needs to keep on that ground. And if it takes take the brickbats from the extremists in the party who will try to move him on it um, because the only way he's going to win an election is by concentrating on some of that stuff. Brilliant. Well, I think um, I think it's 12. Oh, have we got time for one more question or do you have to jump off? No, no, let's have, let's have one more. It needs to be the final one, but yeah, let's have one more. Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to ask you is, actually, we touched on it a little bit, but in regards to policing, so again, so I grew up in a Portsmouth, it's a very working class community, sort of in and around Portsmouth. And again, we have the same issues you mentioned. There's big issues with violent crime and big issues with addiction. And again, I spent some time on some estates in London and it's the same issues up there. But you have the issue where the two major parties, both Conservatives and Labour, they either scared of being called classist or by actually implementing proper policing and solving some of these issues. How would you go around trying to solve the issues of violent crime and addiction and drug use in these communities? That's a very big question. I mean, certainly I believe that, you know, first of all, an obvious thing to say is you need to give people the best opportunities in life. Um, you know, you need to have a fair economy. You need to have, you know, good youth services. You need to have um, all the infrastructure in place to, to, to make sure that people are not tempted into to this sort of lifestyle. Uh, equally, I'm a believer in free will. I don't believe that just because there isn't a youth club down your road that that gives you the right to go, to go and you know stab someone or mug someone i think ultimately people have to take responsibility for their for their own actions i mean i tend to believe in in intelligence and policing which we don't see i mean i think you said earlier you know we have a very sort of reactive style of policing now where the police will turn out when the crime's already been committed you don't see people walk in the you know, police officers walk in the street anymore um and actually i think that the best period of police in country was where you did have officers walk in the street uh, they knew their communities they knew their towns and their villages they knew who the who, who the troublemakers were um, because they would speak to locals and when you when you have intelligence led policing you can nip it in the bud much earlier than if you just withdraw from the streets sit behind a desk and then 
only when you're called out because there's been a stabbing or a mugging, you turn out with your taser and your handcuffs and your baton and, and try to, to deal with it that way. And so, you know, that takes funding, of course. You need to have enough police officers uh, in order to be able to, to do that. Um, but I would, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in having police out there in the streets, on the streets, speaking to local people, understanding what the, the dynamics of that local community are and trying to deal with things before they, before they get out of control. Thank you very much. And we'll let you jump off now, but thank you very much for coming and having a talk with us. It's so important, actually, that we all talk to each other, regardless of party, regardless of ideology. So we need to move forward together if we actually want to solve some of the issues in the UK. So thank you very much for coming across and coming on our show. Um, and I've, I've, I've enjoyed it. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. Um, yeah, so remember, Paul Embry, follow him on Twitter. It's on the screen. Um, his book as well, I've ordered it, so that's going to come soon. Um, yeah, no, I think it was a fascinating discussion with Mr. Amber. And again, the invitation's there for anyone really, if you want to come on Turning Point Live or you know someone who could be a good candidate to come on, again, we're very happy to talk to people of all different political persuasions because if we want to solve the issues in this country, as I said, it's important we come together because otherwise we end up arguing about very petty things when there's larger things in hand that need attention and they need fixing and it's above sort of party politics or ideology, it's about actually helping people which I guess most people in politics are trying to do. So I guess, yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in in today. It was, again, very interesting for us. Um, we're going to be live again next Friday. So we've got Calvin Robinson on the show on Friday. So we'll be talking, I guess, about identity politics, BLM, all sorts of the very interesting and fascinating topics. Um, so I hope to see you guys there. And thank you again for tuning in.